Good evening and welcome to all of you. We are delighted that you can join us for this year's James Madison Lecture. Uh, the lecture really is a flagship event here at the law school every year. It's one of our longest running programs, lecture series. It began in 1960, and the inaugural Madison Lecture was presented by Justice Hugo Black, and it was at this lecture where he famously illustrated his theory of the absolute protection of free speech afforded by the First Amendment to the Constitution. Um, and in the years since, uh, the lecture has hosted justices of the court and judges of the United States Courts of Appeal who have addressed a broad range of issues connecting in one way or another to the law and public life, to civil liberties and civil rights. We are thrilled this year to be welcoming the Honorable Stephen Higginson of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Uh, really grateful for Judge Higginson for being able to join us this evening, and we're looking forward to his lecture, whose title is James Meredith, Muhammad Ali, and Lieutenant William Kelly, Cases and Controversies Before the Fifth Circuit. He'll be introduced uh, by my colleague Steve Gillers shortly, but I just want to say personally thank you, Judge, for joining us, and we really are thrilled that you're here with us this evening. Uh, my colleague Steve Gillers is now the director of the Madison Lecture, and he will, as I say, introduce Judge Higginson. Professor Gillers is now the director of the lecture, having succeeded to that position uh, from our uh, late colleague Norman Dorson, who passed away over the summer. Uh, and I think it's fitting this evening, uh, this first Madison Lecture, since its very first one, when Norman Dorson wasn't a member of this faculty to remember Norman Dorson and the enormous impact he had on this school over the course of many, many decades, and indeed the enormous impact he had on American law uh, through many institutions, this law school, the ACLU, and others. Norman was, among other things, director of the Madison Lecture for 40 years. Uh, and this lecture series bears his personal imprint in many ways, and I think that the tradition that we continue this year is in many respects Norman Dorson's tradition. And so we remember and celebrate him tonight as we continue the tradition in hearing from Judge Higginson. Uh, with that, I will turn things over to Professor Gillers, and we look forward to a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor, and, and thank you all for coming. Um, <clears throat> Norman uh, was the faculty director of the Madison Lecture beginning in 1977, and uh, his penultimate act on behalf of the lecture series was to invite Judge Higginson, or more accurately, to recommend that the dean invite Judge Higginson, but the dean always did what Norman wanted, so. <laughs> He invited Judge Higginson. His, his ultimate act was last year at this forum to introduce uh, Chief Judge Lynch of the First Circuit. That was the last um, Madison lecturer that, that Norman introduced. Sylvia Law reminds me that Norman's introductions were always a tour de force, and I will not try to match what Norman was able to do. What I did try to do was learn something about Judge Higginson that is not on Wikipedia or the official biography at the Judicial Conference. Uh, so I did a little reporting. Now there are several relationships operating here. I will disclose them. Uh, Judge Higginson's law school classmate was Lewis Lyman, who's here. And I, my first boss in practice was the legendary Arthur Lyman, Lewis's father. And Judge Higginson tells me today that while in law school, he spent a summer working with Arthur Lyman on the Iran-Contra hearings. So you can see the little web of connections that I'm creating. I wrote to Lewis, uh, since I knew him, I wrote to him and I asked him, very innocently whether he has something amusing about Judge Higginson from your law school time together that he could share. And he wrote back and he said, let me think about what I can share. 
And in case there was any ambiguity, there is then a little smiley face. <laughs> so at that point, I knew that I was on to something, and my investigative reporting uh, heated up. And so I have another family connection. My daughter Jillian clerked for Judge Higginson, and I tapped into the clerkship pipeline to see what I could learn about him from five years of clerkships. Incidentally, Judge Higginson sat, uh, celebrates his sixth anniversary on the court next week, I think, right, November 2nd. In any event, um, Jillian surveyed the clerks and sent me lots of interesting stuff. I'm gonna mention one comment because I think it's a wonderful introduction to our speaker. Everybody knows that all clerkships are great, but some clerkships are more equal than other clerkships. <laughs> and clerking for Judge Higginson seems to be, certainly is from what I've learned, including from Jillian, but not only, because she's very circumspect and told us nothing, <laughs> uh, one of the best. And so this is from one of the clerks who responded to Jillian's request for introductory material. This is from Hank. There are so many wonderful stories and anecdotes that we could all share, but one of my favorite qualities of his is the fact that he always, always, always took time out of his busy schedule to meet the people important to his staff and clerks when they came to town. During my year, I think he spent personal time with friends and family members of every single person working in chambers. When any of us had someone in town, he would tell us to bring them by chambers for a quick chat. Yet he would inevitably spend 20, 30, 60 minutes with us, sitting in his chambers around the couch, just talking to people and learning about their lives. And this wasn't a meet and forget. For the rest of our time there, he would ask about the people who came to visit. It was such a selfless, caring act that any more about his character, that said more, more about his character than anything else possibly could. So I give you Judge Higginson. It's a delight to be here. Uh, um, I'm sad Norman Dorson isn't here. I'm sad Arthur Lyman isn't here. There are other people that have been huge influences in my life um, that I wish that could be here. My wife is here, um, and a lot of law clerks are here, and friends, Gary Katzman, Louis Lyman, Louis's wife, Lisa, maybe their daughter, Abby. Is Abby here? Coming, okay. Um, Madison said that he wasn't the father of the Constitution because it was the work of many heads and many hands. My talk tonight is that, that there is truth in that, that many heads and many hands continue to write our Constitution and write the decisions that I issue and my courts issue. So largely my talk tonight is gonna to be about a corrective that I think I can offer perspective on having been a lawyer in front of our court for 15 years and now a judge on the court, which is that the work lawyers do, I wanna to try to make an argument for you is indivisibly connected to the decisions we issue. If there is any one interpretive method that explains what judges do, you just have to peel back and see who was the compelling lawyer behind it. Even though lawyer attribution remains largely invisible, I think that's changing. Uh, the problems come when there's judicial overreach, when judicial ego or judicial celebrity or a single interpretive mindset resolves a case. So that's a little insight um, to my thesis. Um, what indisputably was the work just of Madison, his own stenographer's work, was the most complete record we have of the notes taken in Philadelphia. He didn't publish those notes until the other framers died, at which point he remarked, I outlived them, and I may be thought to have outlived myself. He was 37 in Philadelphia. I was 37 almost 20 years ago. Already then, I was what he penned as an inferior executive officer in Article II as a federal prosecutor. Now, flash forward, I am an, on an inferior court, as described by the Constitution, <laughs> in Article III. Um, and 
a lot of my theme is going to be the importance of humility from judges and the importance of recognition, both credit and blame to lawyers. Um, so I'm mentioning some of these points not to sort of be falsely modest. I did then argue in the court that I now sit on. Now I know my colleagues as friends. Before I had no idea what made them click. I actually, before I used to go up to the podium like this in the court, I promise you the thought that was the last in my head was the opening stage direction to Macbeth. Thunder and lightning, three witches enter. <laughs> it just, that's what it seemed to me. And I would wonder, What's on their minds? What are the ingredients they need? And in a sense, is it all witchery? That uncertainty did intrigue me enough to write a few articles when I was teaching, before I got on the bench. And tonight, finally, I thought I'd pull together the experience I have from six years on the bench to explain to you how I think lawyers and judges actually interact. Judging is witchery, to quote Shakespeare again, if we kill all the lawyers. But I think we have had a killing field until almost exactly the year I got on the bench. And the reason I say that is about then, our court at least, moved from an hard copy record and briefs in hard copy passed by hand to litigants to judges to a fully digitalized court system. So every single, we get 8,000 cases a year. They're all right here on this iPad if I wanted to stop and do some work. They're all a hyperlink away, the entire record. So to give you an idea of the sea change that has occurred, when I used to come up to the podium, the court would say, we've read your briefs, we've read the record excerpts, you can assume we haven't read the record. And as a lawyer, I thought, how could you not have read the record? But it was just the mechanical difficulty. Now when I read a brief, every single citation to the record has a hyperlink to that point in the record. So verification is instantaneous. Now what that means is that there doesn't need to be a killing field in that now, scholars and lawyers can immediately trace back from decisions to the lawyer briefing and the lawyer audio. On Friday, I think, the D.C. Circuit heard the Texas teenage abortion case. Merrick Garland approved that that would be live audio telecast nationally. The Ninth Circuit puts its arguments up on YouTube. Oral argument and written argument is all immediately available. Nothing that I write as a judge can be disconnected from the lawyering that gives it to me. Only when you don't connect the lawyering does judging to me seem to be a hell broth of ingredients that we just conveniently label. I'm making an overstatement here, but we give it labels like originalism or pragmatism as if the judicial ego is the one making the decision. That's because we do yearn for the predictability and the teachability and the provocation of these labels. Those labels also allow lower court judges like myself, when our opinion isn't embraced by the Supreme Court, it's sort of the palliative, which is, well, that's because so-and-so decided it with this interpretive method in mind. It also, a label like that doesn't require you to do what my colleague Carolyn King recommends for every case, and I try to do, which is a deep dive into the record in the law given by lawyers. Again, I'm on an intermediate appellate court. We have 13 active judges right now. We get about 8,000 appeals a year. And my proposition to you is what is authoritative is not an interpretive method. It is whatever authority a lawyer can give me compellingly. So in other words, the boil and bubble of judging is yours. It's lawyers. Lawyer Thurgood Marshall, to try to pick cases that everyone in this room will know, in Brown v. Board of Education, more than Chief Justice Warren and the unanimous court, and then lawyer Abe Fortas in Gideon versus Rainwright, more than Justice Hugo Black and that unanimous court, they wrote our Constitution. Lawyer Marshall rewrote the Equal Protection Clause in Brown, disproving the Plessy equation that separate is equal. He said no, and if you know his oral argument, and if you've read his brief arguments, which are almost never given in constitutional textbooks today, he was asked in argument, well, what about Plessy? Why do we overturn Plessy? And in an extended answer, he basically said, because, and these were his words, we've grown up. And he said, we fought two world wars together. And you're telling me blacks and whites can't go to schools together? And when I read that in the transcript, just as sometimes when I'm hearing an argument, you hear a lawyer make a reduced argument, you know the decision has been written right there. Whether the court's going to acknowledge it or put some interpretive gloss and dressing over it, 
The outcome has been written. The clerks know it, the lawyers know it, my colleagues know it, you feel it. Abe Fortas did the same thing in Gideon versus Wainwright. The question that came to him was, well, does your client have a special circumstance that would require a lawyer being given to him? He excoriated the court. He told them, and I quote, if you keep struggling with your impossible question of special circumstances, you're just forgetting the realities of what happens downstairs. To, to these poor indigent people, when they're arrested, they're brought into strange and awful circumstances to a court, and there, he said, Clarence Earl Gideon, defend yourself. Apply the doctrine of Matt v. Ohio. A reduced authority, Clarence Earl Gideon, apply the doctrine of Matt v. Ohio. The absurdity writes the opinion. Both those lawyers became justices. I think if they were alive, they would agree with me that almost all good judging comes from good lawyering if we start peeling back to see who gets credit. A year ago, I was on a panel with Margaret Marshall, first woman Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. She wrote the same-sex marriage case that was 2003 Goodrich in Massachusetts, years before the Supreme Court issued it. She told me about an audience like this giving her an award, as judges often get awards. She saw Mary Bonato, the lawyer, and she made her stand to get credit. And that little story is sort of the theme, the many heads and many hands that actually are forever writing our Constitution because a lawyer compels a court to change its direction. Scholars, I do think, are beginning to realize that and integrate work product. More and more, I had a large case that came to our court involving um, deferred action, immigration stuff. You may remember it, Obama and the executive orders. At that point, what was happening, I was asking questions with my panel to the lawyers it's all there on audio. The very next day, law professor blogs are lighting up with law professors saying, well, Higginson asked this question, the attorney answered this one, this would be a better answer. I think scholars are beginning to integrate directly into the advocacy, not in older forms like amicus briefs, but even in their blogs that then are accessible. Um, and there's beginning to be a blending and a permeability of it, which I can't quite predict where it'll go, but I think the corrective to sort of facile arguments about judicial ego and interpretive methods, and instead now plunging back to see who convinced a court and why, is a good realignment, that granular lawyering. If that's true, that that's what's important, the lawyering is more primary in writing our Constitution than the judging, what you need in judges is the talent to understand your arguments and the open-mindedness to consider them. You do need the work ethic also to get through all that lawyers give us. Two questions in our current Senate questionnaire to me highlight that. Question 17 asks anyone who's nominated to write down the phone numbers of all lawyers in the 10 most significant litigated matters you've personally handled. Lawyers, what they think of you. Opposing counsel, how revealing to talent and temperament if we really focused on their views of candidates. Interestingly, Madison records that the framers perceived that value too. On June 5th, 1787, Madison records that the, the framers were at loggerheads as to how to select judges. Wilson had proposed that Congress would pick. No, he opposed Congress picking, saying big bodies are prone to intrigue, partiality, concealment. He said we need a single responsibility. Then Rutledge says, no, we can't give that power to a single person. The people will think that we are leaning towards a monarchy. At that point, Madison reports that Franklin, Ben Franklin, interrupted and he said, let me just tell you what they do in Scotland. There, the nomination proceeds from the lawyers who will always select the ablest of the profession to get rid of him <coughs> and, sh and share his practice. Here, he said, the interest of the electors to make the best choice would align with the interests of the country. <coughs> the other question that's important on the nomination form is question 11 that asks all nominees about any membership they've had since law school. Now, I'm going to avoid recent controversy about membership, but let me talk just through the framers. George Washington, we haven't heeded his farewell adv advice to avoid fractionalism and the spirit of revenge. But before that farewell address, before the Constitution was even written, some of you will remember that after the, right around the Treaty of Paris, he addressed his officer corps in a famous address he gave called the Newburg Address. It's often remembered because during that address, his officers wept because he stopped 
and reached for his spectacles and said, I apologize, I've grown gray in your service and now find myself growing blind. He sympathized with their demands, but their demands were to have a military elite actually mutiny because of Congress not giving them back pay. And he denounced that. He, he basically, at that point, ended the immediate crisis, but it reemerged that spring, some of you may know, in the form of a national military society called the Society of Cincinnati. Washington again sympathized with their benevolent purposes, but he consulted Jefferson. They spotted the danger, which was a hereditary clause. And both of them discussed and realized it would not be good to create a society with leverage over and blurred lines between it and government. So when I think about judicial selection and the importance of open-mindedness, I wish all White House counsel, now, past, and the future, would pin up the note that Washington wrote to himself before he addressed the first meeting of the society, which read, strike out every word, sentence, and clause, which has a political tendency. He'd written that to himself to say to them. After all, what is the judicial oath we take? Title 28 USC 453 gives the statutory one which reduces to justice without respect to persons. It's a larger mouthful than the constitutional one that Madison wrote. If you know in, Mad in, the, in the Constitution, there's the Article 6 federal officer oath that judges give through 453. The more famous celebrated neighbor is Article 2, the presidential oath. We know the president pledges to do three things, protect, preserve, and defend. But Article 6 requires judges to swear to what? Just one verb, support the Constitution. So I was thinking about that, and I looked it up, and it's what's called a contronym. Its two primary meanings are to bear the weight of and to give assistance to. Before I explore how lawyers and judges bear the weight of and give assistance to the Constitution, I'll give you a quick Fifth Circuit frolic relating to the other presidential oath. Irving Goldberg was on our court for 31 years. Before that, he was a tax lawyer. He had the good fortune of having a client named Lyndon Johnson. So when Kennedy was shot, Lyndon Johnson, this has been told to me by my colleagues, called Goldberg and said, have I become president? And Goldberg, very nimble, said, you are president right now, but it might be advisable to memorialize that. The president, uh, Lyndon Johnson said, who could do the job? He said, anyone who can take an oath. And Goldberg remembered to say, but whoever you get better have a copy of the Constitution to read the oath. Back to my oath, support the Constitution as in bear its weight. I was taught at Yale by the late Bob Cover. I can't give you a better book to read about bearing the weight of the Constitution than his book, Justice Accused, Anti-Slavery in the Judicial Process, which described judges and all their different reactions to whether they would follow their conscience or follow the Fugitive Slave Act and return slaves. To support the Constitution as in assisting it, well, these are stories that we all learn. Chief Justice Marshall assisted Article I, giving Congress implied powers in McCullough versus Maryland. Then he assisted Article Three, confirming that the judiciary has the power of judicial review. But tonight in this room, how many of you could name the lawyer who prevailed in McCullough versus Maryland, who represented the Bank of Maryland? Because in my mind, that lawyer indivisibly with the court wrote that decision. After all, the lawyer argued for nine days. The court wrote the decision three days later. No briefs. How can you not say that lawyer wrote that decision? His name was Daniel Webster. Can anyone in this room name the two lawyers that argued Marbury versus Madison, February 11, 1803? If we can't, something's wrong. At the end of an article that I wrote, I quoted Emily Dickinson, to fill a gap, insert the thing that caused it. The thing is the lawyer. Just focusing on NYU, getting ready to speak to you. Consider Tony Amsterdam. Is, is he here today? No, okay. Well, you all know Furman v. Georgia. The court gets credit, 1972 decision. How many of us have gone back and listened to Tony Amsterdam's argument? If you listen to that argument and read his briefs, he writes the decision. I'll just describe a few moments of what I call constitution writing, not constitutional advocacy. First, right before he sits down, he brings up the distant past. He says Lord Ellenborough in the House of Lords in 1813 wondered if without the death penalty for commercial theft, trade would stop. 
And Amsterdam reminds the justices that Parliament did repeal that law and England, quote, did not fall. Amsterdam, in rebuttal, stands back up and he wants to make a point about the present tense. And these tense things will be important in a few minutes. The facts of his case, and I'll quote him. It was a regular garden variety burglary murder, unintended. Somebody shot through the door. There are thousands of these, he told the justices. The jury comes back with death. The defendant is black, the victim is white. It is all the aggravation in the case. Such powerful present tense fact advocacy. And then, right before he sits down, he shifts to the future, which drives the court's ultimate decision. And he warns the court, if you allow these statutes to stand, there will be rare, arbitrary, usually discriminatory, but provably undiscriminatory, infliction of a punishment that escapes all other kinds of constitutional control. How eloquent. Think of how much he's packed into that. The decision in Furman is a one page per curiam. It's one paragraph, two sentences long. Who wrote that decision? Tony Amsterdam writes the decision. If you read the hundreds of pages of concurrences, Tony Amsterdam's past appears. There's Lord Nellenborough for precisely the proposition he offered. There is heavy emphasis by the justices that the fatal shot was through a closed door. And turning to the future, of course, the court mostly says, we have a freakish system. It's arbitrary who gets it and who doesn't in all ways other than race. That's the court's decision. He's written it. Another colleague you have, um, um, Professor Newborn, he recently wrote a book that I received, Madison's Music, and many of my colleagues have complimented it. He argued at least the 2000 Supreme Court decision, Legal Services versus Velasquez, invalidating funding restrictions to the Legal Services Corporation. Most of his argument time is consumed by the four dissenters, but he manages to get in two exchanges at least with Kennedy, who will be the author for the court in 5-4. He quickly goes to the past. He says it's not a decision called Rust. It is your decision, Justice Kennedy, Arkansas Public Television. Interestingly, Rehnquist had written Rust, and Rehnquist therefore attacks his distinguishing of it over and over again. Newberg, New, Newborn, so I haven't met him in person, but you can see how eager I would be to have a lawyer like that in front of me, <laughs> because he shifts instantly and he injects humor, very self-deprecating, gentle humor. He says to Rehnquist, that'll teach me to do that, meaning to distinguish his case too much. He then gives a limiting principle that speaks to the future, again addressed to Kennedy, to my memory. You can read his brief, you can read the oral argument, and you can decide if he indivisibly with the court changed our Constitution in the First Amendment. A last extraordinarily spontaneous moment that he attained, that you do see lawyers attain. At one point, Stevens, and I think Souter, ask him the same question simultaneously. And without missing a beat, he says, you know, I have to admit, I've always had a fantasy of one Supreme Court justice calling me on the phone, and I get to put them on hold and take the other one. <laughs> that just comes out. Lawyers that are that good and convincing, they enhance their credibility and the points they're making. I could go on, but there are other Madisons, other heads and hands. Arthur Miller, Bob Bauer, the late Norman Dorson, all argued in front of courts, my court, extraordinarily convincing in huge cases. And if you do peel back the same skeleton that the courts announced were the ones the compelling lawyer gave them. Consider what's been called the most famous footnote in the history of Supreme Court. I haven't found the briefs or the transcript for the 1938 Caroline Products case. And Professor Lusky has said it was a law clerk inspiration working with Justice Sohn. I can't disprove that. We'll give one justice credit. Um, for the footnote that most of you will know, footnote four, telling judges like me there needs to be searching judicial scrutiny to protect discrete and insular minorities when prejudice tends to seriously curtail the operation of political processes. But undoubtedly with that accelerant, it has been lawyers that have ignited the firestorm that has changed our Constitution. Think Baker v. Carr, Reynolds v. Sims. Start with Baker, re-argued in October of 1961. Listen back, who was the Solicitor General? Archibald Cox. Felix Frankfurter starts testing him. They have this wonderful exchange about whether President Jackson ever did or didn't say, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. 
But at the end of that, Cox comes back, and I think this statement writes the decision in Baker v. Carr. The court was concerned, can we mandamus a legislature? Can we do this much of an intrusion? And Cox answers something. He answers as follows. I think, by and large, the people in this country rec recognize that a representative democracy depends upon voluntary compliance with the law. And once this court or another court focuses its attention on what the law is, the chances are the legislature and public officials will comply with it. Those chances are very great, much greater than they are while the issue remains undecided. So if Daniel Webster indivisibly with the court gave Congress implied powers, if Thurgood Marshall indivisibly with the court revised our equal protection for all of us, if Tony Amsterdam indivisibly with the court stopped executions across the United States, if Archibald Cox indivisibly with the court gave us one person, one vote, I could go on. There are other constitutional risers. You may have never heard their names. Some of you might. This has been born in New York, moved to Louisiana. Um, Richard Sobol. Hands? Some of you? Yes? OK. Good. Well, these are the people writing our Constitution. Rick, you'll, the rest of you will know him as soon as I tell you who his client was. Gary Duncan. Gary Duncan in Plaquemines, Louisiana. It was alleged that he slapped a white teenager's elbow. He wanted a jury. He didn't get a jury. Duncan versus Louisiana goes up to the Supreme Court. Richard Sobol argues it. Listen to the oral argument. I think you're, I, two points about that oral argument. Not only was he extraordinary, and it largely maps onto the decision, but sometimes the losing lawyer writes the decision as compellingly as the succeeding lawyer. The assistant attorney general from Louisiana in that case laughingly said, quote, Magna Carta did not guarantee jury trial to anybody. And that went over with the same sort of thud of silence until a justice remarked, I think I have a pretty good idea what Magna Carta says. Is it surprising that when Byron White, who had a wry sense of humor, writes the court's decision, he writes um, that jury trial has existed for 10 centuries with impressive, impressive credentials traced by many, not all, maybe not one, <laughs> to the Magna Carta. Heart of Atlanta Motel, another famous Commerce Clause case. Isn't it lost when attorney Ralston, a staunch segregationist, ignored Hugo Black and just announced and yelled, there are 43 million white people in the South. I'll say it for all of them. So loud, Congress can hear me. Please don't do us any more favors. Lawyers lose as compellingly as they win. I want to play for you, thanks to um, Oyez, a lawyer who I think is quite remarkable. He's an atheist, a father, a doctor. His name was Niedow. He argued the case Elk Grove. His argument was the phrase under God in the Pledge of Allegiance couldn't be there. I'm going to play for you his argument. I want you to hear what I think of as a, a Caroline Products footnote for a moment. I don't need to explain it more because he does it extraordinarily compellingly. Um,
The point for that is who's giving the jolt? It's the lawyer that's giving the jolt. It's the lawyer that compels the court to assist and bear the burden of the Constitution. Cox and Baker, Cox again in Sims. New York City's lawyer, the civil rights lawyer, William Kunstler, twice, 5-4, making sure the government can't criminalize the burning of the flag. His partner, Arthur Kinoy, gives us Dombrowski, Powell v. McCormick, telling Congress that the qualification clause means they can't expel someone the people elect. Heller, we all know Heller. What a jolt. We know Lopez, right? A jolt for states' rights again. We think Scalia, we think Rehnquist, 5-4. But did they write those decisions? I don't think so. Look at who was arguing in Heller. Walter Dellinger, Paul Clement, Alan Gura. Paul Clement and Alan Gura both reappear in McDonald. Interestingly, on my point about attribution and being thorough with traceability to see who should get credit or blame for where our Constitution is today, Lopez, go back to the Fifth Circuit and look at the lawyers who won there, because all the court did in the Supreme Court was affirm Lopez. Who wrote it? My colleague, Will Garwood, a famous and well-respected, not ideologically perceived judge. Interestingly, Heller. Not many people know. Scholars debate Heller as, is it an originalist decision by Scalia? What are the, the blizzard of historical citations? How many people have even traced back seven years that a case U.S. versus Emerson was written in the Fifth Circuit? Norman Dorson was a Namikas lawyer in it. Will Garwood writes it uses the exact headings that Justice Scalia. It is a blueprint for Heller. So you can say it's originalism and it's Scalia. It almost never is. It's almost always lurking in a lawyer's work product that convinced or didn't convince this court or lower courts. So our job is to support the adversary process, but also to make it less invisible. We have nothing else to support judges. There's no person, there's no president, there's no party, there's no philosophy, there's no membership in a society. There's certainly not judicial celebrity. If I'm correct that lawyers are writing the constitutional law much more than judges, all again you need from judges is open-mindedness, talent, and a work ethic. And if I had to compress the qualities to one, I would borrow one from Alvin Rubin, who was a very respected judge on my court. And this was what he thought and praised. He wrote over 2,000 circuit and district court opinions, over 50 law review articles. The gem I cherish most is he said, a judge should be self-consciously eclectic. Where the, text, where the text is not itself decisive, he should consider its historical background and the future implications of all possible decisions. He should enrich his reasoning as much as possible by all information relevant to a just result. Imagine saying self-consciously eclectic in a confirmation hearing today. <laughs> now, all the Madison lectures have been collected and mine gets to end up in a little book. They started out great rights, the first collection, then evolving constitution, then unpredictable constitution. Most recently, embattled, it's like a wilt downwards. <laughs> so I'm really hopeful we have lawyers here that are gonna rebound the constitution and a good title for the next one might be our eclectic constitution. <laughs> That's my first large correction, which is that lawyers have written and continue to write the constitution. Now I'm going to try to be a little more granular, and I promise in the last third I'm going to get to those three cases from my court to try to illustrate my point. But lawyer primacy, now I want to be reductionist. In six years, plus the 20 that I practice, I'm going to try to tell you what I see is the way lawyers get me to write their decisions. Uh, again, the theme being many heads, many hands, lawyers are writing our Constitution. When I was 37, I was flush with executive inferiority. I could indict, checked only by Madison, who put in the presentment clause to grand juries. The point I want to make is lawyers have the power of initiative to start a case. Judges receive them. Yes, in many cases, we say not you or not yet. Last spring, I heard a case involving the taking down of the, of the Confederate monuments in New Orleans. And then the next session, I heard an attack on Mississippi's flag, the last to have the Confederate battle flag insignia. Each time we did say, not you or not yet, no legally cognizable. So of course, courts can stop, but they can't initiate. Recall Needow. I just described his argument to you, but he lost. Why? He wasn't the custodial parent. So on standing, the courts stopped. Now, assuming we have a case in controversy, how do lawyers then still control judges? They sculpt the case, issue preclusion. The year that Lewis and Paul Engelmeyer and I clerked, the court heard Mistretta. It was the first constitutional attack on the sentencing guidelines. 
Think of the constellation of lawyers. Who would be the best you could name in 1998? They were all there. Alan Morrison, Paul Bator, Charles Freed. The lower courts had splintered all over on a million theories as to why the guidelines might have infirmities. And there was a question from a justice to, um, it was Morrison arguing on behalf of Mistretta. How did you pick non-delegation as the problem? Well, that is what he picked, and he lost. And it took, what, 15 or 17 years for different lawyers to say, no, the attack is the Sixth Amendment. And we get Booker Fanfan. The court responds to the lawyers that are compelling and plagues the light, and that invalidates mandatory guidelines, issue selection. So, but assume we have a case, assume we have talented ones that pick the best argument. How does a lawyer win? How do they get me to write? Well, when I have a question a concern, an inclination, which I do all the time, and I scribble in the notes, question mark, that's what I'm gonna ask, and I'm gonna talk to law clerks. I think the lawyers that win are the ones that give me authority from the past, the present, and the future. And remember, I tried to describe Amsterdam and newborn doing that. I don't know if they think that way, mm -hmm. but what is vital and what's kept me up at night when I was a lawyer was am I gonna be able to immediately classify the question? As Carl Llewellyn wrote almost a century ago, law professors are, quote, lopsided men. He said, but that's good for students because judges are too. So the difficulty for a lawyer, I think, standing before judges is you've got to know where they're lopsided and you've got to go lopsided with them. And my advice to students and before that to Department of Justice lawyers, and I think now I've proven to myself it's true, is that the key is listen for tense. What is the tense that the inquiring judge is using? Some judges focus on the past. So if we know Philip Bobbitt's book, Constitutional Fate, and his colored pencils that correspond to different interpretive methods, that would be textualism, historicism, doctrinalism. The law as written in the past, what does it compel the answer to be? But other judges, colleagues of mine and myself, sometimes we're most concerned about the present, the facts of this controversy. Was the issue preserved? Is it harmless? Is there plain error? What's the unfairness, to borrow from Posner? What's the right, the wrong victimhood that we want, that present this controversy? Who should win? Other judges, you'll hear it in the tense of the question to you as a lawyer. The question is a future. How does the future say the problem has to be answered? Right? They're looking for a rule that will apply fairly to the future. As Alvin Rubin put it, they don't want to issue a decision that is an ad hoc railway ticket decision good only for this day and station. The lawyer who assembles compelling authority to answer each of those tenses, or usually even two of three, will prevail. Car talk, right, the click and clack brothers? They're off the air now? But listen to that and how they blend to diagnose a car's malfunction with their callers. The joking, the probing, the questions. Judging at its best, at least in oral argument, when I face a lawyer, is like that, right? I'm doing error correction on my court. That's what we do. We try to see if there's an error. That only happens well when I'm engaging with the lawyers, usually in these three time dimensions. The reason I came to this view, this classification, is I was asked to teach con law, but as Lewis knows, I took con law at Yale with Charlie Black, and we started and finished with the Ninth Amendment. We never did anything else. <laughs> So when I was asked to teach, I really didn't. I called Chemerinsky. I said, can I have your case book? Can I have all your notes? Can I have your lecture? And it was just very intimidating what he sent me. It just was too intimidating. So I did what I tend to do as a judge. I understand when things are written in paper, decisions or briefs, when they're impregnable, I see the nuance better if I can back up into how the lawyers class. So I'll go back to the district court hearing. Well, for me to teach con law, I needed to hear what the lawyers had said in all these famous cases I'd be teaching. I called Jerry Goldman. If you don't know him, you should. He's the one behind OES. Jerry Goldman gave me super user access to OES. I could get behind cases and do searchability that you can all do now. And I listened to every single case that was in the Chemerinsky casebook that I could get. And I, at that point, I had this moment. I said, I haven't heard a single question that isn't a past, a present, or a future. It's all, every lawyer, a law, question a lawyer will get will be one of those tenses. Certainly in six years, I haven't heard colleagues ask one. They are different questions. You can classify them quickly. Rubin said again, the best brief is like a good song. It plays a melody the judge will remember and hum when he writes the opinion. By present, I mean, how do you use the facts, the victimhood in the case? Let's hear. 
Jerry Goldman. This is Brown v. Louisiana, 1965. Louisiana's in the Supreme Court, where you would think fact advocacy wouldn't, men, wouldn't prevail. You tell me if the lawyer doesn't lose the case with poor command of facts. Louisiana is trying to explain that its libraries are not segregated. That's present tense fact advocacy, just a statement that's false. Deny the blue book mobile. And at the Supreme Court, that's going to write the decision. Future tense advocacy. You may not know the case Kilo. It's the case whether the government could aim a thermal imager at a house. Did they need a warrant for that or not? Now, the counsel who won had to propose a rule. This is the future tense. And it's going to be obvious to you when you hear it how judges probe in questions about future tense. So first, a lawyer will establish a rule, and then judges will probe that rule, and then they'll adopt it. Here's his rule. Any, you need to get a warrant if. I think uh, any time that the government is seeking to capture information from a private place like the home, and they cannot do it with their own unaided human senses, and they may not use technology to do the same thing. OK. Now, what happens once that? As soon as he makes that statement.
back up. Sorry, sorry. Um, no, Senate Justice O'Connor jumps in. All future tense questions. Has the lawyer thought of a rule that will work appropriately in the future? If not, that future will collapse. A more famous case to go back to Kunstler, right? Texas v. Johnson. The future, I want you to listen to two things. You tell me if the case gets written, the 5 4 decision gets written because one lawyer's constitutional future collapses, or as if or whether the decision is written, as people often describe, because of originalism. Because if you conclude it's the latter, and that that's an interpretive method that one judge just had and prevailed with, well, that's in tension with my thesis, that almost every case we can look to, if you peel back and study what was argued, one lawyer won and one lawyer didn't win. So I'm gonna play two clips from Texas v. Johnson. One is the future tense, and the other one is, um, well, you'll see. They're probing with the future tense. Does your rule work? Hypothetical questions. Now, they will probe in the past. What was the intention of the framers in this case? I think Sandra Day O'Connor asks the question. <laughs> So again, on that case, um, originalism, like most interpretive glosses, I think cuts both ways to best. What's much more convincing, what I think predicts the outcome, what writes the decision, is that a lawyer was unable to answer questions as to how would we distinguish between various symbols and sacred events. So present tense advocacy, future articulating a rule, and then judges will ask about the past. And we've talked a little bit about that. Lawyers are finely trained to use the past. Present tense advocacy, find the bookmobile, blue bookmobile, establish it. Future tense, you have to be nimble. You've got to be able to do cost-benefit analysis, compare blue bonnets to constitutions. Past tense, some of you may know, Brian Garner issued a big compendium, 700 pages long, called The Law of Judicial Precedent. He had many co-authors for that. Uh, I won't repeat any of that, but he concludes with this sentence, good judges like good lawyers, and if I were writing it, it would be good judges because of good lawyers, must mine all relevant sources for guidance, ought to be grateful when they find it. Mine and be mindful of precedent. Yes. All I'll say about past advocacy here is much more sort of edgy advocacy. When lawyers can turn past case law upside down for their benefit and get us to follow them, or when lawyers can actually tell judges to do what judges always say they won't do, which is to reject controlling precedent. Let's start with that, because that's judicial heresy. Stare decisis. We have to show unflinching obedience to higher authority. Well, here I'm gonna quote not Professor Rubin, but Judge Alvin Rubin. This is from a decision of his. When today's vibrant principle is obviously in conflict with yesterday's sterile precedent, courts need not follow outgrown dogma. And with that sentence, he overturned Louisiana's exclusion of women from juries, despite a Supreme Court decision 12 years earlier that it upheld the exact same exclusion. He called the Supreme Court decision, this is Alvin Rubin, outgrown dogma. Now you know my thesis here. My interest is, well, who was the lawyer? 
that got Alvin Rubin to be so insubordinate. I'll just tell you her initials, R-B-G. <laughs> Abe Fortas again, Gideon. The Supreme Court had bets as precedent. As great lawyers can do, he compelled the court to realize that bets had been a dead end, that we should rewind the constitutional clock to Powell v. Alabama, the Scottsboro boy. The Supreme Court, when it wrote bets, saying, well, Yes, capital defendants like the Scottsboro Boys, and also other defendants who have special circumstances. They thought they were following the pull of federalism. We won't make states pay for all indigents, just these. That was a hard precedent for Fortas to deal with. But like great lawyers, he takes his adversary's best authority and makes it his own. So he said, Betts is the federalism injury. He said, I've read every case you've written since Betts. You've overturned every state highest court. You always see a special circumstance. They never did. That's the corrosion. Betts is my best authority. You've proved how wrong it is. It was the federalism injury. And then he convinces the court to write Gideon versus Wainwright. Now, there is another lawyer that should get credit. There was a Minnesota attorney general, a young lawyer. Florida was desperately looking for MECA support. They sent letters around to attorney generals all over. A young lawyer in Minnesota got the letter, realized how wrong the position was. He started a counter amicus brief that got many more states. His name was Walter Mondale. Lawyers write our Constitution every day when they compel judges like me, and especially the Supreme Court, to write the decisions that generally then people just stop and say, well, that's this justice or this court, and it's this interpretive method. Okay, now I'm gonna get to the three cases you've been waiting for. And I'm gonna try to show you that lawyers again decided these three cases. In fact, in two of the three, when judges tried to go beyond the lawyer controversy, poor errors in justices occurred. The first one, 1975, my court wrote about a massacre that occurred, took place around the world on March 16, 1968. American soldiers shot hundreds of unarmed civilians in a town called My Life, Vietnam. There was a cover-up. Luckily, it was exposed because one soldier named Ron Ridenauer, and we should pause over names like this. But for him, none of this would have come to light. He wrote letters to the Pentagon, the President, to Congress saying, what happened there is not what they're saying happened. Well, they didn't listen. They didn't respond, so bravely he found a young journalist named Seymour Hirsch, who wrote six articles. There was a public outcry. The Army had to do an inquiry. The Peers Commission concluded that, I think, 28 officers should be charged, 14 were, and however you want to look at it, sadly, only one gets convicted and court-martialed Lieutenant William Calley. Calley's case was exceptional in its day. Professor Belknap has written about it. There was intense sympathy for Calley, both from hawks and doves who thought he was being scapegoated. To give you a sense of that fury, my library went to the National Archives to find all the ephemera and letters that were written to our court telling us we better free Cali. Here's one. I am disgusted, angry, frustrated, because that fighter, my second case, that black loudmouth Cassius Clay could pay a few hundred thousand of dollars to courts to stay home. Nixon and Kissinger get honored and you treat Cali like a dog. Grinning black Cassius Clay did not even go. That fury reverberated up to the White House we know from Halderman's notes that Nixon wanted damage control above all else because of the war effort at the time. He approved, and I'm quoting, dirty tricks to discredit one witness. This was a different witness. Another soldier, Hugh Thompson, was flying a helicopter over My Lai at the time. And he saw what was happening, and he landed his helicopter between advancing troops and unarmed Vietnamese. He was going to be the government's star witness. Nixon wanted him discredited because when he got out of the helicopter, he did point a weapon, or it was contended that he did, at the advancing troops, his own people. Nixon felt that the American public would never credit anything he said if that had been shown. But ultimately, the court-martial came down to whether the jury would believe Cali or his company commander, Captain Medina, had Medina ordered the soldiers to shoot unarmed people. Cali's attorney was a man named George Lattimore. He was outmatched. He lost at every single portion of the court mistrial. He couldn't decide whether he wanted to dispute the massacre had occurred, or yes, it had occurred, but Cali wasn't responsible. He wasn't because he was psychologically unfit or because he had a defense of superior orders. Medina testified consistently always he had never gave the orders. Who is his lawyer? 
famed Boston lawyer, F. Lee Bailey. He immediately took him out to get a polygraph and he answered no, truthfully, to the question, did you intentionally infer to your men that they were to kill unarmed noncombatants? By contrast, Callie and Paul Miadlo, who stood with him shooting women and infants, were cross-examined as follows. What did you do? I held my M16 on them. Them, they were babies and children? They might have had a loaded grenade. Babies? Yes. Were the babies in their arms? I guess so. And did the babies move to attack? I expected at any moment they would make a counterbalance. Callie's conviction was affirmed in military court review, but on September 25, 1974, the United States District Judge Robert Elliott granted him a habeas petition. And I'll quote from the last portion of his decision. It was 68 pages. He called it obiter. He cites Plutarch, the Bible, and Carl Sandburg to conclude with his view of war as follows. War is war and has been throughout recorded history. When Joshua took Jericho in 1565, when Ivan the Terrible ordered an entire Jewish civilian population drowned, when Truman bombed Hiroshima, leaving 80,000 dead, most of whom were women and children, but he was elected president. Elliot goes on to compare General Sherman, quote, gloried, idealized, beautified, sanctified, with Cali, quote, pummeled, pilloried by the press, taunted and tainted by television, reproached and ridiculed by radio, and then he rules that Cali was denied even a fair chance for the fair trial. Hindsight's 2020. My point tonight is that the consequential error, the travesty that occurred with that district judge's ruling and his obiter giving us his view of war, not what was litigated in front of him, fortunately was corrected because of better government lawyering in my court. Our court went en banc. Judge Ainsworth reinstates the judge court martial in a workmanlike point by point decision. It, there's no virtuosity in the opinion. Footnote to record, footnote to record to prove the trial was fair, the government had proven what it did. I don't have a larger, bigger lesson except to say to you at the conclusion on this case, um, I am talking tonight about lawyer primacy. The bigger point, of course, is we don't want the court martial for Cali led to house arrest. It's very deflating in that sense. It pales to the massacre of the victims. So when I'm talking about lawyer promise over judicial ego, you obviously can't, remember, you can't forget the memory of the victims. And in that sense, give a claim to Harvard, the Nuremberg Trial Project they've just finished, digitalizing the entire Nuremberg trials. Extraordinary. It shows the tenacity of victims and lawyers that can somehow bring a little justice to unimaginable injustice. So I've focused on lawyers tonight, but it began with victims in my lie. Then it required a soldier to write letters. Then unfortunately there was a cover up. Then fortunately there was a stubborn journalist. Then unfortunately there was a corrupt president that tried to impugn a star witness. Fortunately there were lawyers that still obtained a court martial. Unfortunately there was a lawyer who allowed his personal view of war to interject. But finally, at least at the end of my story tonight, we had lawyers that were able to establish facts, the present tense, to contradict Callie's claim that he'd just been following superior orders. Every case I've written is indivisibly written by the lawyers who have compelled me to write it that way. It also invisibly has victims and witnesses behind it. My second case, Clay versus United States, came from the same Vietnam maelstrom, involved the world's most famous athlete celebrity. June 20, 1967, Muhammad Ali, the heavyweight boxing champion of the world, he's convicted for refusing induction in the US military. His prosecution was headlined everywhere. The statement that people remember is he said, I ain't got no quarrel with them Viet Cong. He got five years in prison, the maximum for draft evasion. Very few people know that case even came through my court, the old fifth. It did because his habeas petition, no, I'm sorry, it did because Georgia was the district court that affirmed the and was in the old fifth. I think that's right, you will know. Um, Jonathan Eig, you may know, has written a 600 page biography recently, outstanding, doesn't mention the Fifth Circuit once. And that's not a flaw of his. Our decision is unforgettable and should be forgotten because of one footnote. Our court affirmed his conviction and footnote 16 in that decision states, and I'll quote, it discredits the, quote, beliefs of black Muslims, saying that those beliefs are racial and political, fueled by a hatred of the white race. And the authority given by our court in footnote 16 is quoting Malcolm X for the proposition that he prays for plane accidents with white victims. Chauncey Eskridge was Ali's attorney in the Supreme Court. 
he would tell the court, I sense a prejudice against blue, so-called black Muslims, against this defendant who was the heavyweight champion of the world who announced that he was Muslim. The Supreme Court reversed us unanimously. Originally, apparently, the court voted to affirm. But the law clerk for Justice Harlan said, Ali is sincere and the religious beliefs of Muslims are true. It is not just hatred of whites. It is not just political. They have religious views. Harlan changes his mind. It makes the vote 4-4. Justice Stone decides that he needs to come up with a compromise that can get a unanimous court. He then invokes the Stromberg Doctrine, and they perceive that in the lower court ruling as to why exemption was granted, they couldn't tell. Was it because Ali was insincere, as the Fifth Circuit said, said, or was it some other reason? And if you don't know the basis for a conviction, if any one of them is legally invalid, you have to overturn the conviction. The interesting thing that's decisive, the lawyering that's decisive, is Reed Solicitor General Erwin Griswold. He truly acts as the 10th justice in this case. He, of course, is defending the conviction, but he refuses and disavows over and over again my court's personalization of its ruling. He concedes several times Ali was sincere and the Muslim faith is real. He therefore has to retreat from the facts that my court had distorted and he returns to the past. And there was a doctrine, and he argued it, that Muslims do believe in some wars, jihads, and therefore they have selective views. And the law then wouldn't allow selective but the court didn't find it very difficult to be unanimous to say we don't know if that was the basis. The Fifth Circuit didn't suggest so in footnote 16. So to sum up, my court's error against Ali was like Judge Elliott's error for Kali. Both courts injected their personal view of an outcome, belief or disbelief. And each time the correction came from unremarkable opinions, the Supreme Court's Harlan called it a, quote, peewee ruling minimal application of established law. Now, you can say that, and I mean no pun by this, but what it did dodge was frontally saying the world's greatest fighter couldn't fight, which would have been awkward for the court. And it also dodged saying all black Muslims are exempt. So in fact, it was a somewhat inspired decision. But to me, it's written by the Solicitor General who will not defend the overreach my court had done. So. Each time you have judicial overreach error that needs to be corrected by ethical lawyers or by good lawyers using fact advocacy, or in the second case, using past tense doctrinal advocacy. My last case for tonight, US versus Barnett. James Meredith was an Air Force veteran. He wanted to get into the University of Mississippi, known as Old Miss. This was a full-scale constitutional crisis. Most of you are familiar with the outline of the case. If you're not, Jack Bass wrote a spectacular book called Unlikely Heroes, the Dramatic Story of the Southern Judges of the Fifth Circuit, who translated the Supreme Court's Brown decision into a revolution for equality. Another great book firsthand is NYU graduate Constant Baker Motley's book, because she was Meredith's lawyer, called Equal Justice Under Law. As for lawyer primacy, this is, to me, I won't articulate it well, but it's exquisite. You have Thurgood Marshall back in Brown prevailing a new dawn for the Equal Protection Clause, giving himself the key that years later, the client that comes to LDF, him, he can give the keys and get them into Ole Miss. The lawyer creates the law, and then he can apply it years later. And Motley describes how Marshall came to her office and he threw a letter on the desk saying, this man's got to be crazy to want to get into Ole Miss. <laughs> and she writes, and that meant it would be my case if I wanted it. The rest is history except a district judge, Judge Mize, over and over again, accepts Mississippi's arguments. Oh, this decorated airman must be a troublemaker. It's not his race. He's a troublemaker. He's not qualified. And Mize, over and over again, denied that there was a policy of segregation, even though University of Mississippi, after Brown, had instituted a requirement that required five alumni letters to get in but there were no black alumni. <laughs> Mize ruled that way again and again, and Judge Brown on my court, he would later remember, I quote, we would set aside Mize's order, Judge Cameron, a segregationist on the Fifth Circuit, would set aside our order, setting aside Mize's order, and we would set aside Cameron's order, which would set aside our order, setting aside Mize's order. <laughs> Charles Eagle in his book, The Price of Defiance, gives you more vivid understanding of this. When Mississippi Attorney General Patterson heard the Department of Justice, Burke, Marshall, Robert Kennedy were coming in, 
because the Fifth Circuit had these warring orders, injunctive orders. This is what the Attorney General of Mississippi said. Robert Kennedy, criticizing a judge of Judge Cameron's stature, is like a jackass looking into the sky and baying at the great American eagle as it soars above. <laughs> and when Governor Barnett heard that Justice Hugo Black, Circuit Justice, had interceded to vacate Cameron's stays, making my court's mandate that Meredith would get in, Barnett said the following, that Black's ruling is, quote, just as illegal as if the Supreme Court of Kansas had issued it. Now, what's less known is that the issue that gets to the Supreme Court is not Meredith getting in. There was a riot, he gets in. It's whether Governor Barnett, who stayed defiant to the end, became the registrar himself and physically blocked Meredith, would get a jury in his contempt trial. The case became U.S. Barnett. The companion case at the same time, a little earlier, was desegregation of New Orleans schools. We know who the judge was handling that. A very different principal judge, Skelly Wright. But my view to you is that the desegregation in that case and the desegregation in Meredith occurred because of the same advocacy moment. Let me read how Bass describes it in the desegregation case in New Orleans that came first. Louisiana Attorney General Gramillion stormed out of Wright's court saying, quote, I'm not gonna stay in this den of iniquity. He spat on two black women and bellowed about being in a kangaroo court. Thurgood Marshall there immediately perceived his opportunity that now he could align past and present with future. And he told Skelly Wright, this is no longer a case of Negro children seeking constitutional rights. This is now a challenge by officials to the state of Louisiana to the sovereignty of the United States. The duty of this court is clear. Skelly Wright phones Burke Marshall he phones Attorney General Robert Kennedy. The judge wants to hear from the government lawyers, will the government back up my order? They would. The threat of contempt is what brought Louisiana into compliance. Now, Skelly Wright was a unique man. Right place, right time. He didn't see his job to assist and bear the Constitution as very difficult. Quote, I did what I did because the Supreme Court had said it. There wasn't any way out except subterfuge. Other judges were using subterfuge to get around the Supreme Court delays and so on. But I grew up around federal courts and I had respect for them and I tried to carry out that tradition. The present at that time had bogged down in abject segregation and violence and Alice in Wonderland type delays. The past, some of the blame can be on the Supreme Court. Brown too had been very opaque about implementation. So lawyer Marshall understood his advocacy had to switch to the future. That this was an affront to the judiciary. Like Wright, my court interrupted its hearings to be certain the federal government would come in. Judge Brown later described this in his oral history. Judge Tuttle, sitting very firm and erect as always, addressed Burke Marshall and said, if we issue orders, will the executive department of the United States enforce them? We have no police power. We have nothing but orders. They gave us assurances that they would carry it out. At that time, President Kennedy went on national television. They brought in a great number of marshals. It did lead to the only real bloodshed that ever occurred in the Fifth Circuit in this revolutionary effort to assure blacks equal protection of the law. The decisional moment comes to a head in a very tense en banc hearing in September of 1962. The two opposing attorneys, you have Charles Clark and you have Jim Coleman representing the Board of Regents for Mississippi. You have Motley representing her client, Meredith. You have Burke Marshall there. It starts at noon, it goes till dark. About dark, Clark and Coleman ask the court for a 20 minute recess. Can we talk to our clients? They take a 20 minute recess. They come back, the Board of Regents, many of them appointed by Governor Barnett, agree to adhere to the rule of law and avoid contempt. Clark and Coleman, the lawyers for Mississippi, and later, maybe not surprisingly, both men, like Motley, the first black female federal judge anywhere, like Thurgood Marshall, all the lawyers end up on federal courts. How wonderful. And in fact, Wisdom wrote the strongest endorsement for Clark, who had been the attorney defending segregation. He said Charles Clark emerged as a shining star. He represented a lost clause with flair. He argued vigorously, made the best of a bad case. He was deferential to the court. He acted with dignity and grace and conducted himself in every way according to the highest tradition of advocacy. He won my respect then and the respect of all judges on our court. Wisdom and Brown's histories confirm that Coleman and Clark with Motley were decisive in resolving Meredith's case. 
in that recess convincing their clients. That isolated Barnett, he was alone at that point. Now he stayed defiant, that's why his contempt pace goes up. And I'll finish with discussion of that and then my conclusion. Was he entitled to a jury? Our court divided equally on that question. We certified it to the Supreme Court. That was heard October 1963, Solicitor General Archibald Cox with Leon Jaworski, an interesting lawyer. I think I'm correct that he refused to go be a lawyer in the Nuremberg trials because he didn't think that crimes against humanity had been crimes that could have been known, and he didn't want to be part of that. Again, a lawyer with immense subtlety and talent. Here they are teamed up, opposed by Charles Clark, who would become chief judge of my court, in the Supreme Court. Cox uses every tense a lawyer can use. He starts with the present tense. He's describing Barnett's intransigence, his demagoguery, and he says Barnett arranged against us everything he could in the state of Mississippi. The entire process of constitutional adjudication was assaulted. He shifts to the past. He traces back the discretionary power of courts to impose contempt to Madison and the Judiciary Act of 1789 but he mostly goes to the future. He warns, if you allow Barnett's nullification to challenge the power of the court to act as a court, Leon Jaworski steps up in a rebuttal argument. He asks rhetorical questions to the judges. Now, very few lawyers will turn and ask judges questions. He asks, if, the court, if court decrees are to be evaded, as Barnett had done, what is the right to trial by jury worth? If court decrees are not, are not to be evaded, may it please the court, what is the Constitution worth? In my opinion, Cox and Jaworski write the opinion, what Clark would later write in the opinion. You can read the decision. Quote, a court without the power to effectually protect itself against the assaults of the lawless or enforce its orders against recusant parties before it would be a stigma upon the age. They prevail. Now, it's true, courts take back in footnotes what they give you in text. In footnote 12, the court wrote, what Clark would later came was his victory. It's an interesting footnote. In view of the impending contempt hearing against Barnett, effective administration of justice requires that this dictum be added. Some members of the court are of the view that without regard to the seriousness of the offense, punishment by summary trial without a jury would be constitutionally limited to that penalty provided for petty offenses. It comes back to our court. The four judges that had always stood together divided. Brown, Wisdom, Tuttle said we have to prosecute Barnett. He's broken the rule of law. Two people died. But Reeves broke with them. Reeves said Meredith's in. All we can get him from is a petty offense. We're just going to make him a martyr. Without Reeves' vote, the matter was dismissed. The contempt proceedings weren't pursued. Now, of course, 50 years later, the law that Lowe's lawyers explored, both sides, is relevant again, I think I'm correct, Sheriff Arpaio, that was his claim, I need a lawyer. Well, it traces back to United States versus Barnett, much more to the lawyering than anything the judges wrote. The last point I'll make about this third and final case, and then my conclusion, is that if you actually look at the lawyer argument, there are extraordinary what I'll call constitutional offshoots that never end up in the decision. Here's what Cox argues at one point. He doesn't just intimate footnote four of Caroline products. He puts it front and center. Listen to him and listen carefully. If I may put it this way, so long as one thinks, it appears to me, of the court, the government, as oppressing people, then the power of the jury to intervene is an important safeguard. But as soon as one begins to think of the law as an instrument for protecting the weak or the oppressed, as an instrument for securing constitutional rights of a minority, of protecting us, he says, if you will, our better selves against our worse self, then there is a difficult and more complicated problem. There's a lawyer who happens to be the Solicitor General who's saying, well, the jury trial's right's important when the government is oppressing, but in cases where the government is vindicating the oppressed, we shouldn't intercede the jury. Well, that's an eclectic proposition. It's a powerful lawyer. The court doesn't grab it. It's a constitutional offshoot. In that case, the court doesn't articulate. Tonight, I hope I've encouraged more heads and more hands to keep writing our decisions, my decisions, the Constitution. First, to scholars, I would say, if you're not appearing in front of us, Newborn, Amsterdam, Miller, Bauer, fantastic professors that have changed our constitutional destiny, then write, dis write articles 
that trace back and attribute good or bad results to the lawyers that compelled courts to get them. Don't stop with judges and their ego and their interpretive methods. Trace back to see who argued what. Second, to soon to be lawyers here, be expectant, right? Throw deep, be eclectic. The law is written at least indivisibly with you. Until today, at least mostly invisibly. Third, to lawyers now, be vigilant against judicial overreach. Use past, present, and future advocacy to check us when we disconnect from the arguments lawyers present to think that we have a footnote 16 that knows that black Muslims aren't sincere. Or we're like Judge Elliott in Obitter, counterfactually saying Lieutenant Calley was just doing what soldiers in war do. Or like Judge Mize, counterfactually saying that Meredith was a troublemaker. Fourth, pro se litigants, recently spotlighted, Seventh Circuit discussion. They aren't here in this audience, I hope not. They are at a disadvantage. And it's the reason that projects like Arthur Lyman, helping public service, or like Robert Katzman, pro bono projects for representing aliens are so vital. Because my whole discourse has been how indispensable what the revelations are from lawyers. So then what happens to overworked or ineffective lawyers or especially pro se litigants? Fifth, to judges like me, if they're those here, cherish public engagement, um, that is to say that lawyer dialogue brings order, oral argument. How sad, how sad the American Academy of Appellate Lawyers this summer issued a report that oral argument in circuits across the country are at historic lows, 20% or less in merit-based decisions. A very wonderful luminary New York Law School graduate, I think, Professor Judy Resnick, has written about this problem extensively. We've privatized disputes. Argument in public with judges and lawyers is diminishing. On the criminal side, plea bargaining with appeal waivers. Much less of this vital process I've described is occurring. I have written for six years decisions that are written indivisibly with the work product that I can hyperlink to. My decisions are mostly quiet ones. I'm going to finish with some really wonderful, loud ones that profoundly affected our Constitution. Go back 40 years, Roe versus Wade. Listen to the indivisibility of Thurgood Marshall. This is an issue we think indiv divides us permanently. Here's Justice Marshall with Jay Floyd. Who is Jay Floyd? He's the attorney trying to prosecute for Texas Norman McCorvey. You would think they'd be at loggerheads. Marshall asked Floyd, define for me the line between life and no life. Floyd says, impregnation. Marshall says, is there scientific data to support that? Floyd answers, there are unanswerable questions in this field. Marshall says, I appreciate that. Floyd apologizes, have I made an artless statement? Marshall dignifies him and says, I withdraw my question. Floyd says, thank you. And then he says, when does the soul come into the unborn? If you believe in the soul, I don't know. To me, there's a startling moment of interactivity and respect between lawyer and judge. Candor may not have decided that issue, or better known, what better exchange between a lawyer and a former judge than the one that occurred on June 9, 1954, and who was present? Who was present? June 9, 1954, first Senate hearing nationally televised. Who was present? Who was present? Present there. Norman, Norman Dorsey. Ah. Oh. Out of law school. You all know what happened. Senator McCarthy had just accused Fred Fisher, a young lawyer who was working in the firm, Hale and Door, that Army lawyer Joseph Welsh had. Welch interrupts him. Give, him. give me your attention. How wonderful. Lawyers can do that. Arthur Lyman could do that. Give me your attention. McCarthy, talking to Roy Cohn, his chief counsel, parries insultingly, I can listen with one ear and talk. Welch interrupts. This time I want you to listen with both. Again, the brilliance of cross-examination, lawyer strength. Trying to evade, McCarthy accuses Welch of baiting Cohn. Again, an adept lawyer, Army lawyer Joseph Welch, turns to Cohn right away, ignores McCarthy. Did I do you any personal injury? No, sir. I meant to do you no injury. No, sir. Nails down that fact. That's when he turns back to McCarthy 
and says, Senator, you've done enough. Have you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you no sense of decency? Okay, go back much further, three times, 1776. Wasn't the question, do we sever from England? We can all practically recite as if it's poetry, our forebears answer. Yes, present tense advocacy. We can all recite it. Let the facts be submitted to a candid world. Here are the injuries and usurpations that equal tyranny. They use present tense advocacy. We know the list of injustices. 12 years later, 1787. What's the first question that Madison records that the framers focused on in Philadelphia? Can we rewrite? Or do we just have to revise? The, Const the Continental Congress Commission was explicit. You are there for the sole and express purpose to revise. But the framers, adept lawyers as they were, they seized on an antecedent past, the legal axiom, and it's in Madison's notes, that we're free to, quote, conclude nothing, propose anything. Clever lawyers. And that's when they proposed the national government transmitted that by letter back to Congress. Finally, November 19, 1863, our country's greatest lawyer, giving homage to the carnage at Gettysburg, he asks all of us, how can a nation dedicated to the proposition that all are created equal long endure? What pathos he must have felt asking that question where 50,000 soldiers had died in what is still the largest battle ever in this continent. He says the future has the answer so that government of, by, and for the people shall not perish. But if you look at his three paragraphs, each one is advocacy in a different tense. The first one, he begins with the past. Our fathers brought forth on this new nation, conceived in liberty, dedicated to the proposition. Then the second paragraph, the anguished present. He's a lawyer using all three tenses. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, met on a great battlefield where soldiers gave their lives. And finally, the future. We have unfinished work, the great task reigning before us is to give increased devotion to the cause for which they here gave their last full measure of devotion, that these dead shall not have died in vain, so that our government stays one of, by, and for the people. Um, your, this says that I'll talk about Judas Clark, <laughs> and I will, because like Arthur Lyman, when I'm invited to talk at a law school, I'm always gonna finish giving credit to the people that um, taught me. Um, so to express my gratitude, you, many of you won't know who Judas Klar is, and I won't tell you much except to tease you. Um, well, I like the quote, Breakfast from Timothy. Audrey Hepburn says, anyone who ever gave you confidence, you owe them a lot. Well, she gave me confidence. Judas Klar is someone who survived World War II. Um, she fled across Russia and became the first woman government head of the, uh, the, the government department at Harvard. And I was fortunate to write my thesis with her. All I'll tell you is she wrote a little essay I hope you all read. The essay is entitled, Putting Cruelty First. And she asks a question, why don't we? Now, you have to read her essay to understand her sophistication and her personal answer to why we don't put cruelty first. But the answer I've tried to offer you tonight, especially teachers at a school like NYU, is that we do put cruelty first when we train lawyers to use the past, the present, and the future to write the decisions that judges write and to continue to write our Constitution. When you train lawyers that can do that, the Constitution will stay eclectic, stay strong, and keep growing. And we also put cruelty first when we train lawyers to be able to stop cruelty the way that Army Welch, Army lawyer Welch, stopped Senator McCarthy. Thank you. So there's a reception. Um, Judge Higginson has given us a lot to think about. We can think about it again because it's on YouTube. At, at this point, Norman would say who the next speaker is next year, and it is Bernice Donald of the Sixth Circuit, will be our Madison lecturer next year. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>